Mark chapter 4, verse 28, Jesus gives this. He says there's this plant with the stock, and then the head, and then the full kernel of grain. The full kernel of grain is the sanctified person, all right? And this is kind of him giving you a picture of how the Christian life is, development, but it has to do it by the stages of, that he, he is given, all right? Maybe you never saw this one. This is a pretty cool one. In Matthew 25, verse 20 to 23, it says he, he wants you to double the talents. You ever catch that? Every single one of them, you want to double it, okay? So it's not just that you get saved, but you need to have the second work of grace. You can see that in that, that he's telling you every time I require of you twice as much, all right? And that's the idea. Matter of fact, Matthew chapter 25 is the reason I believe in the rapture. It's one of the reasons I believe in the rapture. And it tells you that the only ones that are going to go in the rapture are those who are purified. You remember? Because it tells you that they have their vessels full of oil. You know what I mean? And it says the other guy's light was going out. It doesn't say they're sinners, okay? It says their light was going out, okay? And the idea is you need to be sanctified in order to go to the rapture, and that's what happened. So that whole chapter is on holiness. And then we go to Mark chapter 8. Some people say, Ben, don't even go there. I mean, the guy gets touched twice, okay? I agree with you. But that's not salvation and sanctification. But I really think it could be a New Testament imagery of the whole idea, okay? Just like it was in the Old Testament. God, God had no issue doing it back then. Why would he have any issue doing it then? He, the man sees when Jesus gets done taking him outside the city. Here we go again. We have that same picture of the situation with Lot. He, he j takes him outside the city. I don't know how, if he was grabbing him by the arm, but that's kind of how I picture it. So he has to take him outside of all the distraction, all the sin that's going on in the city. That's being saved, all right? And he touches him once, and, and friends, that's the picture being saved. And he says, open your eyes. And the blind guy opens his eyes. He's like, oh, man, everything's a whole lot different than I thought it was going to be. I see trees walking around, you know? I mean, that's, that's messed up, you know? What? I mean, I don't know if his eyes were doing this thing or what was going on, but, you know, Jesus kind of healed him part way. And so he, he says, I see trees walking around. He says, that's not good enough. And Jesus, you know, touches him again. And then he sees clearly. Now, now, what I tend to tie that into is Acts chapter 9, which we've already covered. Remember the idea of Saul, Paul? When he got sanctified, you notice it said something like scales fell off of his eyes. All right? And then he could see clearly. All right? Then he could see holiness like crazy. That's what I'm trying to tell you. If, if, talking to teens, I tell them that all the time. You don't like the Bible? Get sanctified. <laughs> I mean, because D.L. Moody put it this way. He said, man, I learned more about holiness in like the few hours after I got sanctified. Just open up my Bible once the scales fell off, you know. I mean, that I did my whole life before that. Maybe, you know, people come to me all the time. I don't care about the Bible. I don't understand the Bible. Yeah, get sanctified. <laughs> I mean, read Romans 12, 1 and 2. It says, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. You can't do that if you're dead in your sins. You've got to be saved, all right? Then you can offer yourself one time to be sanctified, in Romans 12, verse 1, and it tells you in 12, verse 2, why? It says, because then you'll be able to have your mind transformed so that you can understand what God's perfect will is for you. You ever had a hard time discerning God's will? That's why. You're not sanctified. You get sanctified, and you'll start to understand his word, <laughs> and that will help you understand his will for your life. All right. The old and the new wineskins. This is a picture of Jesus basically says you can't keep going in the same state you're in. If you're going to have the fullness of the Holy Spirit, there has to be an even deeper change, and it's permanent. You know, the old way you used to live, the old wine skins will burst. They can't handle this. <laughs> You've got to die. All right? But when you die, there is a potential that you've never seen before, and it can only be put in a new wine skin, okay? A, a new experience with me. And then we have the two baptisms that's been covered in the Old Testament. Well, here it is as well. Remember it? We've already covered it a bunch. John the Baptist was repentance, water, baptism. And then we have baptism with fire, which is, the, which is Jesus' work. And then we have the full armor of God. I like to throw that one back into people when I'm preaching. I say, guys, you have to put the fullness back in the armor. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it is the word of God. We can get in all the basics, but that's not all it is. It's the fullness of, you know, the full armor of God. This is the fullness of God, everything. The full salvation, you know. Everything, every part of the armor is full, so put that back into it. You know, the, the fullness of the Holy Spirit, the sword of the Spirit. And then we go on, the seal of ownership, in Ephesians 1.13. It says, for, you know, uh, I used to have that one memorized to see if I can do it anymore. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having believed, so you're already saved, you're marked in him with a seal, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And friends, I'm going to end on this because we're kind of getting along. It goes on to tell you in that passage that he's a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. 
you know, I have a sermon on, on prayer. And I sit there and I talk about it. I said, you guys, you feel pointless. I mean, you don't have that disciple experience that they had. They knew Jesus. They watched him brush his teeth. They watched what he ate. I mean, I, I feel frustrated sometimes when I'm reading the Bible. And I'm like, man, they knew him like that. I mean, I don't know what sport he liked, but they knew it. The disciples did. How could a man who's sitting there receiving by knee nail, you know, that's what I'm doing. I'm praying and talking to him. I've never seen him, all right? But how can I have a better and deeper experience and relationship than they had with him? And I, I, I was sitting there one day, and I was saying, man, I'm just having these mundane days, just basic days. I'm not that important in this world. But all of a sudden, Jesus started throwing scriptures into my head. You know, come and see a man who told me everything I've ever done. You know, the idea is that he cares about the mundane days when you're an intercessor. You really want his eyes glued on you? <laughs> Don't forget about that point. Get sanctified so you can be an intercessor, all right? And then, when you're praying like that, I'm telling you, he just has a look on you like you wouldn't believe. He cares about every day of your life. I knew he cared about my salvation. I knew he cared about my sanctification. I knew he cared about my marriage day. I knew he cared about all those things, but I didn't know he cared about everything. And friends, when you are an intercessor, I'm telling you, your prayers have been put in a piggy bank, a guarantee that you're going to have your inheritance. I'm telling you, it, it, it's going to happen. <laughs> you are moving God whether you think you are or not. Let's pray.